Hello, everybody. This is Matt Williamson at Pop Goes the 60s. And tonight I've got a writer with us, Jude Kessler. And Jude is a John Lennon biographer of sorts. And she has started, she's in the middle of a very long series of books she's writing. She's on volume five. And we're going to talk about it here on Pop Goes the 60s and some of the stuff that uh, she's been writing about. Jude, thank you for joining me. Matt, thank you so much. I have, you and I've chatted a couple of times prior to this. And I tell you, you are my kind of person. You do a pre-planning show. you got an outline. You are right on it. No wonder people enjoy your show so much. Well, yeah, the devil is in the details, as they say. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's talk about, I've had several writers on the show here, and I'm, I'm running the gamut of all kinds of different styles of writing. And you write, uh, this is essentially a multi-volume series on John Lennon, which will probably be in the 10 or 11 uh, volumes. Is that correct? Right. I, it was planned to be nine volumes. Well, originally I was going to write one book. And when John was 21 years old and had just made that loose managerial agreement with Brian Epstein on the 10th of December that he would manage them, um, I was at page 1,000. <laughs> and I wow. said, Okay, so it isn't going to work to do one book and go all the way up through December of 1980. I got to have another plan. So I thought, well, maybe I could do it in three books. Then book number two, Shivering Inside, came out, which only covered a year and a half. It's 1961 through part of 1963, and it was 750 pages. And I said, okay, go back. This is not going to work. So how about nine books for John's association with the number nine. You know, I don't know if all of our viewers know that John was born on the ninth in Liverpool. He died on the ninth in America it was the eighth, but in Liverpool, it was the ninth. He went home to nine Newcastle road. One of the first songs that he and Paul ever wrote was the one after nine, uh, nine Oh nine. Uh, his son by plan was born on the ninth, uh, Sean, Everything that happened to John, so many associations. He met Yoko on the ninth, and we could go on and on and on and on. So I thought nine books would be great. But this last book, which came out in October, which is um, Shades of Life, you can work out with it if you don't want to read it. It's really heavy. Um, is eight months. It covers January through the middle of August, 1965. Mm -hmm. And you're with John and the Beatles almost day by day as they are making their second film for United Artists, which is A Hard Day's Night, uh, I'm sorry, which is Help at that time was known as Beatles 2. And, and someone su suggested that it was Eight Arms to Hold You. And John and Paul just flatly put their foot down, their collective foot, and said, we are not going to write a title song about eight arms to hold you. We do not do songs about orgies. No way. We're not doing this. And finally, they came up with help. They're making that film. They're making the soundtrack that goes with it. They're going all over the world to make the film. And we could talk about why they were doing that. Uh, they go to the Bahamas. They go to uh, Austria, to Salisbury Plain, to Twickenham Studios, all over London. They're doing that while John is writing his second book of poetry and prose. I mean, writing a book alone is enough work, mm -hmm. but he's doing that at night when he gets home at like 10 or 1030 until midnight and then going to bed and getting up at five because he has to be in London for hair and makeup at 630. Mm -hmm. They are nominated for the MBE. They do a European tour of France, Italy and Spain. I mean, come on. You know, they yeah. are doing a lot. So the books, ultimately, I had to break that book into two parts because there was so much. Part one, part two. Mm -hmm. So now, as you just said, very correctly, it's probably going to be 10, maybe 11 books. Mm -hmm. Well, let's time. let's start with uh, how your writing style and your, the first volume, which is, I don't think that one's even available anymore. Um, the 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 first volume starts with basically his life up his when he was born up until what time? Up until that night when they signed their contract. Well, they don't sign a contract that day. They that contract is later in January, but in December, uh, when they when Brian Epstein has proposed management to them, 
They've gone to his office, they've discussed it, and John has said, right, manage us then, and he's made the decision. And Mm -hmm. it ends that evening as George and Paul and Neil Aspinall uh, are all inside the grapes partying because they finally have what they really needed, which is a professional manager who is going to get them a recording contract and is going to get them to John's toppermost of the toppermost. But John won't come in. And according to so many people who were there that night, John refused. He was sitting on the stone. It's kind of a rough, uneven stone walkway in Matthew Street outside of the graves. And he would not come in. It was bitterly cold that night, but he wouldn't come in. And Paul goes out and says, what's going on with you? This is what you've always wanted. This is what you said you wanted. Now you won't come in. And John says, he's going to change us. And Paul says, he said he wasn't going to change us. He said he wasn't going to. And John said, he already says we have to wear suits. He already says, I'm going to have to wear a tie. And Paul said, but that's not changing us. That doesn't change who we are, essentially. That's just window dressing. And John knows. He knows. And the story that he tells Paul is one of the most touching stories. And John Lennon told it several times. Mimi, when he goes away to art college, gives him money and she gives it to him and he needs the money. He's always cadging off of other people and, and borrowing cigarettes and food money and everything. And she gives him the money under the stipulation that he will come home every weekend with his laundry to get the laundry washed because she wants to see him. And he said, I should have refused that money. I should have said, I'm in college now. I'm not coming home every weekend. I'm independent. I'm on my own. I'm not doing that. But I sold out. I needed the money. And I sold out. And she had me under her thumb. And now that's what he thinks he's done again. He has sold out. And that this man, this Brian Epstein, is going to change them and make them different. And that's how that's how book one ends. Now, I, I wasn't familiar with that story. So that was told by John to Paul. And one of the things I liked about your work is you have, your work contains lots of citations, footnotes, and and, and just backing up your stories. So um, where did that one come from? Well, a lot of them came from the people of Liverpool. And what I did in the first book, and I, I can't do this anymore because so many of them are, are now gone. And I would write a chapter and then I would send it to the individual, whether it was um, June Furlong, who was the life model at Liverpool College of Art. I sent her her chapter and she was so picky about the detail that she would say, well, yes, yes, June, yes, you've, yes, you've got me right, but the tendril is hanging down on the right side of my <laughs> hair, not the left, you know, and she would make me correct it. Bill Harry said, you have things basically right, but you've got me sitting in the front room at Ye Crack. Move me to the back room. Put me under the painting of Lord Nelson. And you've got me drinking ale. I only drank bitters. So they were trying yeah. to paint the correct portrait. Some of the stories came from people that knew Mimi. Some of the stories came from people like Julia Baird, who would tell mm-hmm. things about her mother. For example, the detail that Julia had a framed picture in their bathroom that said, do you want your teeth to look like a daffodil? Then mm-hmm. brush them. <laughs> you know, there were minute stories that were shared by people like Rod Murray, John's best friend at Liverpool College of Art, Helen Anderson, um, a, a gentleman who is now the head of the art department at John Moore's University, Colin Fallows, who did the Stu Sutcliffe retrospective was a, just a teacher, who was a professor at Liverpool College of Art when we were first there in 1993. And my husband and I sat at a long table with him and he gave me the telephone numbers for Johnny Guitar and Patty Delaney and Nicholas Horsfield and um, Arthur Ballard and George Jardine, mm-hmm. all of the big artists of that day that were with Stu and John. And You know, um, Johnny Guitar, who was present when John and Paul come to recruit Ringo to um, join their band. Um, And he tells the whole story of what that was like. So we we were really blessed to get these people to share stories that you don't get everywhere else. 
How did people react when you approached them? Because they didn't know you. I mean, you, you didn't have, at that time, you hadn't written a lot of great works. Well, how, how was their response and how cooperative were they? Unbelievably cooperative. Unbelievably cooperative. Now, Alan Williams, who I just saw a thing last night saying Alan Williams wasn't really the Beatles' first manager. He was just a booking agent. Well, Alan Williams didn't see it that way. Alan believed he was the Beatles yeah. first manager. In fact, Brian contacts Alan before he does anything as far as moving forward with the mm -hmm. Beatles and says, am I stepping on your toes? Am I going to be taking them away from you? I would never do that. And do you recommend that I work with them? And you know what Alan said, um, but he saw himself as their manager. Well, Brian, Alan would give you all the stories you wanted to know as long as you kept the bottles of wine coming and the food was great and you were in a wonderful restaurant. They called Alan, my husband's laughing over here because he remembers many, many nights where um, Alan and Beryl Adams, who mm -hmm. was married to Bob Wooler, but at this point was with Alan Williams. She and Bob had divorced um, and she worked for Brian at, um, uh, at NIMS. We would go out to dinner with them and the night would start off very calm and we'd be doing an interview and we'd be talking. And as the wine would flow, Alan would get up and walk to the next room and get everybody in the restaurant singing the Welsh national anthem. And then we'd get kicked out. And he was called the Bard of Liverpool because he was barred from just about <laughs> every place in Liverpool. Oh, Rand's holding up a sign here that says to tell you, when we interviewed Bob Wooler, we met him in Lark Lane at a uh, restaurant, a seafood restaurant in Lark Lane. And he was so, such a lovely gentleman. Everybody loved Bob Wooler, loved him. But he decided that he was not going to um, give me an interview until he asked me 10 questions about the Beatles. And as I've told you, I do intensive research on the section that I'm in. Um, right now, I live in 1965. In fact, I wrote a check not long ago, you know, like two or three years ago when we, were, when we actually wrote checks. And I wrote 19, uh, April 18th, 1962. And the gentleman looked up at me and said, ma'am, it's not April. And it sure is in 1962. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm living in that year. But Bob asked me questions that were way outside really? my company my comfort zone. Was he testing you oh, just yeah. to make sure you, you were worthy of giving an interview too? Yeah, definitely. And some other people, you know, took me to do certain things in Liverpool and had what seemed like a harmless conversation, but it, they were checking out the facts. I mean, um, we were taken by Joe Flannery to the Sudley Art Gallery. And as we looked at the paintings and talked, he was quizzing me as well. So they were very helpful. They were very forthcoming. They were extremely kind, but they did check out the source. Mm. Well, we're going to get to Bob Wooler in a moment here, but let's let's talk about your writing style a little bit. What can fans or readers expect uh, from your writing when they buy one of your books? Okay, it is a strange character, a strange creation. It, it's not the norm. I had seen literally thousands of Beatles books. There were coffee table books, there were biographies, there were music experts who wrote on every element of every song. Uh, there were studies of the Beatles personalities, there were photograph books, but no one had done what I really loved, which was to write um, in the vein of Michener, or Irving Stone, if you're familiar with his works that he did on Abraham Lincoln and um, Thomas Jefferson and Michelangelo, in which he would write it as a story. But he, when he did um, The Agony and the Ecstasy, he lived in Italy for 12 years writing that book and did every single bit of research that he could do to tell mm -hmm. you the real story. So I decided to do that with a little twist. Instead of making it like a historical fiction, I would make it a historical narrative, which meant I can't change anything about what happened. I can't, you know, make something happen that didn't. Mm -hmm. It has to go exactly by where they were, what they ate, what they wore, exactly what they had on, what they 
did to the obsessive point, and I'll give you an, an example of this. When the Beatles exited Shea Stadium, somebody somewhere along the road said that they exited in the armored truck that they had come in on. They did not. They exited in a white station wagon supplied by the stadium with the stadium logo on the left hand side of the door. So I found three sources who got this right, about 80 sources who said the armored van. And so we got the footage and the footage shows them very clearly getting into the stadium station wagon. So I try to tell only exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. Sometimes guess- that's hard, hard to do because people embellish. And I know that's what you're leading to, but you read it like a story, yep. but it's mm-hmm. actually what happened. Yeah, so this would be a descriptive slash linear narrative, I guess you would yes. call it. So yes. okay, very good. Well, I know that your the thing I was most impressed with was your your research and your notes, your citations. So one of the things that uh, as I research and, and present this information to viewers, it's always difficult to change a story that's been around for many years, and even if it's wrong. It takes a great effort to change it. Maybe years, maybe it never has changed. But let's talk about an incident. We were mentioning Bob Wooler before. And there's the famous story at Paul's 21st birthday party where a drunk John Lennon gets in a fight with Bob Wooler. And this story is told in many different ways. And the way John beats him in many different ways. And I'd like if you would just treat us to some of the research you've uncovered on yeah. this this incident, give us a little background because this there there is there is a background. Story. Maybe we'll do the background story after you present the facts because the facts okay. are fascinating in themselves. Okay, okay. So fortunately, that was the main thing that I wanted to talk to Bob Wooler about that day at lunch in Lark Lane, and I asked him if he would tell me exactly what he said to John word for word, and he said, "I I absolutely will never repeat that again." Um, this side of heaven. And um, I, all I can tell you is I deserved it. So um, for just that, we won't go into the whole story, but so that people who aren't familiar with why John is going to punch him, John and Brian have gone on holiday to Spain together for several weeks. People act like it was only one night or one weekend. It was a two week trip. And Brian, who is their manager, um, is gay. And he, one of the things that John goes on the trip for many reasons, number one, he likes Brian. He thinks he's a great guy. They're very close. He's a good friend of Brian's. Number two, there's been a controversy that has come up between whether the songs are going to be McCartney Lennon, which actually went on to one of the records or Lennon McCartney. And this is John's band. He invited Paul to join. He invited George to join. He is not going to give up leadership of this band. And one good way to make sure that you've got control of your band is to be in control of the manager of the band. So he is going to go on this holiday with Brian. During the trip, Brian talks to him about what it's like to be gay in the 1960s, which was not a good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, You could get arrested. I mean, go to jail for it. Um, You can't tell anyone. People look down on you. He already was Jewish, which in Liverpool, which was heavily Irish, 83% Irish, was unusual and different. He already felt different. And now he really feels different. And he opens up to John about his feelings. So when John returns, he is needled for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks about nudge, nudge, wink, wink, you know, what happened on the trip. And John gets madder and madder and matter, and matter. And we won't tell the part now that the backstory about Paul, we'll save that for later. But when John gets to the party that night, he's in a foul mood to begin with. And Bob Wooler greets him pretty much at the gate and says to him, and I think this is as close as I can get to what he said, how was the Spanish honeymoon? And John hauls off and hits him. Now, that is not an unusual thing in Liverpool society. When I went to see the Buddy Holly story 
at the um, Empire Theater. Two women in front of me got up and started dancing. Two other women told them to sit the F down. They said, we're not make us, and it ends in a fracas. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a bitch clearing brawl. So one time in Hamburg, Paul is needling Stu, needling him, needling him, needling him, and Stu hauls off and hits him in the face. At, and Paul's playing piano, and Stu just punches him right in the face. So I'm telling you, this is an unusual thing to hit someone in the face. Well, all the guys out there, I've got a very heavily male population. There are th something called fighting words, and most guys yes. will, will agree that this happens outside of Liverpool as well. So, yeah, I mean, especially, especially if some drinks are being shared, that's not on, uh, beyond the pale. So No, no. Hitting someone is not beyond the pale. Okay, so we're going to look at the history of what happens with this punching him in the face. All right, in Cellar Full of Noise, which is Brian Epstein's book, he doesn't make any reference to it. And I totally get that because he makes John apologize and he makes, he's afraid that he's going to get sued. Mm -hmm. So he makes John apologize. He's not going to mention it. In Cynthia Lennon's 1978 book, Twist of Lennon, she says, um, she doesn't mention the incident at all. But in her 2005 book, she says that John gave, uh, Bob a black eye and badly bruised ribs. Now, I, I think that's pretty close to what happened. He did have a black eye. He did go to the hospital overnight. Um, he did get some reparations plus an in the newspaper apology from John. So um, that he, I believe that's accurate. Okay. In The Walrus Was Ringo, which is right after it comes out fairly early, they say Wooler had marks on his face his head and his hands, he had black eyes. But by the time we get to Ray Coleman, um, who is a good friend of John's and probably talked to John about it, he adds the element of torn knuckles, which that seems more like what John would have had. And he says that Bob Wooler had shock. Well, I would have been shocked too if somebody would have hit me in the face. But now we're getting more detail. By the time we get to Miles, Beatles diary. He says that Brian Epstein drove Bob Wooler to the hospital to get his eye treated. And here we go. Here's a new element and a check for broken ribs. So now the story is beginning to get larger. Tony Barrow doesn't state what Bob Wooler's injuries were, but he quotes John as saying, he called me a bloody queer, so I broke his ribs. Now, did he really break his ribs? I don't know, but that's a thing John would say. You know, I'm a tough guy. Look what I did. I handled the situation. Okay, in Chris Salewiz's book on, on Paul, he doesn't say what the injuries were, but he says that John beat Bob Wooler black and blue. Wow, that's pretty accurate for someone that wasn't there. Hunter Davies in The Beatles quotes John as saying, I smashed him up. I, I broke his bloody ribs for him. That was nice of him. And then uh, Coleman in Lennon uh, says he battered his bloody ribs in. Well, Bill Harry, who actually was there in the John Lennon encyclopedia, says John knocked Wooler to the ground and began kicking and punching him. Uh, in the Ultimate Beatles encyclopedia, he says he gave Bob, black eyes, bruised ribs, and torn knuckles, which is an earlier account. Philip Norman in John Lennon, The Life, doesn't list any injuries, but quotes John as saying, I was beating the shit out of him. These are a lot of different stories. I mean, it's how do you get to the truth when you've got all these varieties? In Shout, Philip Norman says he beat Bob Wooler severely. Finally, by the time that we get to... Um, Peter Brown's The Love You Make, you find out that John broke three of Bob Wooler's ribs and sent him to the hospital. And Albert Goldman in The Lives of John Lennon says he had a broken nose, a cracked collarbone, three broken ribs. And Bob Spitz in The Beatles says Wooler suffered a broken nose, a cracked collarbone, three broken ribs, and on and on and on. One of the accounts, which was like in the 1990s, said John picked up a shovel and hit him. 
it's just like that game where you sit in a circle and you whisper something into someone's ear and then they whisper and they whisper and they whisper. And by the time it comes back around, it doesn't even faintly resemble what you said to begin with. So it's so difficult to write something. The other thing, Matt, was when um, Brian and John had supposedly had sex in Barcelona. There are 18 different accounts of what happened. How do you tell the story and tell it accurately without exaggeration, without lies, without conjecture? It's really hard to do. Yeah. And John Lennon himself, with regard to the Wooler incident, he, he explained two very different things. One, that he was very drunk. And another account that he wasn't barely drinking at all when he did it. So right. even Lennon himself gives very different accounts yeah, and it's like it's it's very difficult to write about the Beatles yeah. and to be super accurate. It's very difficult, and the Beatles. I hate to say this, but they're the last people that I rely on because number one, they were too busy to notice. Yeah. They they're living their lives. They're not thinking I need to document this. Mm. Reporters, journalists like. Uh, Art Schreiber and Ira Davis know they're documenting it. So you can count on what they say because they're taking notes. Tony Barrow, very aware. Paul, John, George, and Ringo, they're too busy to, to notice. Yeah. And they don't remember. John says, one thing I know for sure, the one thing that I know is the day that I met Paul McCartney, and then he proceeds to get the date wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, most people, most Beatle fans uh, that insist upon believing every last word that these Beatles say. Right. That this is a very big mistake because they think that that's the gospel. Yes. But if they were to put themselves in the position to have a history written about them and somebody came and relied on them to tell their own history. I mean, I, I put myself through this all the time. And yeah. as I get older, especially, I'm starting to lose what really did happen? I'd have to rely on other things. I, I look at documentation I'm like, man, this happened three days apart. It felt yeah. like three months. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's impossible for one to tell something not only accurately, but without their point of view, impossible. Yeah. So it takes multiple sources to really hone in on something closer to the truth. And it's I think that's what, what people try to do with the Beatles. And and, uh, and the reason for these different Bob Wooler stories, people are relying on accounts told before them. And yeah. obviously, by the time you get to Goldman, Lennon's picking up a shovel, you know. Right. And Goldman right. put a, did another uh, another volume of work on John Lennon. Lennon would have been driving over, driving him over with a car or something. <laughs> exactly probably. right. So it's like exactly. these things do continue to grow. And it seems like now people are trying to get some kind of semblance, some kind of reason and using more documentation to help balance yeah. some of the stories. Yeah, and historiography tells us that people change history for many reasons. One of them being that they want to be in the story. They, If they can include themselves in the story, many people will. And they want to know something that no one else knew. And so you've got to evaluate when someone tells you a story, what is their motive for telling you this? Mm -hmm. Um, my motive is never, ever to exonerate John. John wouldn't have wanted to be exonerated. After all, he says he broke his ribs for it. You know, if anything, he's going to exaggerate the machismo. You know, <laughs> look what I did, you know, beat him up. If John could do all of those things that those people say he did, he sh should have had a great career as a prize fighter. Why are we wasting our time writing songs? Just go in and beat the bloody hell out of people, you know? I think John was always a bigger, um, he mixed it up with people a lot more in his mind than he did in real life. But, yeah. um, you know, I, it, that you can't, history is slippery is Morgan Llewellyn's quote. History is slippery. I talked to you for an hour last week. I cannot remember what you had on. I remember the room that you're in. I can remember that you have a book, a doorstop that's made with strawberries on it. Mm -hmm. I remember that at one point, a, I can a, see it back here. Yeah, oh, it there you go. There, there it is. Yeah. I remember that a pet walked through the room, a really cute pet. But for the life of me, I can't remember if it was, I think it was a dog. Mm -hmm. um, see, that's one week ago, one week ago. And look what I've forgotten. 
imagine what if you say that a big party was going on, there were lots of people in the room and there was a, a, a fracas. How much would we remember? That's that's the hard part. Yeah, it's really tricky. And I think some people just assume that uh, an interview by one of these guys, like takes the Beatles anthology. Well, that's absolute truth. And right. people actually believe that. And that's a mistake. And I mean, I, I've, I've believed that as well. I mean, I'm not... It's taken a long time to understand how this stuff all works. And a lot of the stuff is very accurate, but it's their perspective. And, and sometimes, like you say, they they want to put forth a, a different story. It's interesting that Bob Wooler refused to tell you exactly what he said. Yeah. Because he been, maybe he's he just embarrassed. Told, yeah. And he may have been told not to say it. Maybe that was part of that agreement. Oh, maybe so. Maybe so. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I'll give you another example, Matt, that kind of makes me sad and that people don't know this. But, you know, when you watch Get Back, you remember that scene where they're all waiting to tape and John isn't there. Mm -hmm. And they keep saying, where's John? Where's John? Well, number one, it's 10 in the morning. Anyone who knows anything about John Lennon knows he sleeps during the day. He rarely gets up before one o'clock. So if they expected John to be there at 10 a.m., they were barking up the wrong tree. The fact that he gets there like by 11 is remarkable because he's also got to drive into town. So he got up pretty dang early for John. Well, you remember that scene where Paul is sitting there waiting for him and he's all teary eyed. He's got mm -hmm. like tears in his eyes. He's mm -hmm. like, you know, John won't show up. And why is he doing this to me? And blah, 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 blah. That is edited. They cut right after they say, where's John? And they cut out a whole segment of them kidding around, playing music, laughing. John even phones in at one point, says he's on his way. All that is cut. What you see is, where's John? Why won't he show up? Blah, 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 blah. And then tears. Okay. Yes. Well, that is editorializing by Peter Jackson. Yep. And I didn't catch that at first but when i did realize that i was really disappointed because he yeah. didn't need to do that there was no there was no need to make more drama than there was right and, and he did that i thought that was misleading and i thought you know to, to, to make it look like mccartney was really like losing it as if the band is breaking up that's not what was going on in that moment nope, nope. And it's a shame that Jackson felt the need to do that. He 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 did that in a few instances. I mean, generally speaking, I I think he gave it to us pretty straight. Yes. But um, and I mean, these are minor things, because yeah. uh, in the totality, I mean, I I say he did a. I'm very satisfied with everything he gave us. It was great. I, I've got some nit, yeah, I got a couple of nitpicky things, but they're minor. I mean, in the yeah, bigger but scope. that's just yeah, but it's it, slippery. It's it slippery. is. It you is, and it's, and it's worth pointing out so that people can understand. It's like, oh, I didn't realize that. Because a lot of people commented on that, and that was a big deal for them. The drama that was created out of that, people really lapped that up. Yeah, And unfortunately, yeah, they lapped up true. something that was not true. Yeah, and many instances in uh, book four, which I think you have, uh, which is 1964, the Beatles are on the North American tour. And I have almost all of their interviews in there. And I cannot tell you how many times you'll see it in the book that during a press conference, a snarky comment is made and John goes, oh, because he knows the next day in the papers, it's going to say John Lennon said it. And sure enough, it does. And Mimi is all upset about it. Why do you do that? You're disrespectful. I taught you better than that. Blah, 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 blah. And every single time, and I've got them documented in the notes, it's George. George uh, is being funny. George had a great sense of humor and he's being funny. So the, like the when, press misquoted him. Are they, they always attributed say, to the wrong person? Always, always. Mm. And John is like, well, I'm going to get in trouble about this. Like when they say, how do you sleep with that hair on your, that long hair on your head? George says to them, how do you sleep with your arms and legs attached? <laughs> you know, and then John gets blamed for it. Yeah, it's, it is really interesting. But what's amazing is how much video we have in film and different accounts and magazine uh, interviews and photography 
there was so much available on them. They were so photographed. They were so popular that we're able to take factual things and piece them together to help uh, get closer to what the truth was. And yeah. that's really unusual. We can't do that with a lot of bands uh, or a lot of anything in pop culture, but we can do it with the Beatles. Yeah, it's we're so, I mean, it, I could not do what I do without the wealth of videotapes that, thank goodness, they took these and the EMI tapes that were running all the time. So you not only know how they were recording the songs, but yay, 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 I've got their verbiage. I know what they were saying, really saying mm -hmm. in between each song and while they're waiting for the recording to stop. And at the end of the night, as they're packing their cases up, they just let the tape roll. And John C. Wynn did a miraculous job and way beyond compare of unraveling all of those tapes for us. Um, you know, we have people that have gone before that have done a lot of research and Still, I mean, there's some, a couple of years ago, my husband and I bought Beatlesinterviews.net. And I, we go through those interviews before I use them and re-listen to them. And I have a research assistant, Susie Ducheteau, and we all listen. And we found a couple of mistakes. I mean, minor mm. words that are wrong. But Jay Spangler is the one who started that. And he spent hours and hours and hours and hours unraveling all of these interviews. And we have the documentation. If I didn't have that, I couldn't do what I do. Mm -hmm. So um, it just is. It, thank goodness if I want to tell about the girls running out onto the tarmac at Houston straight for the oncoming landing plane with those mm -hmm. propellers going around, I have video wow. of the plane landing. So thank goodness for, for the internet. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing what we've been able to get garner on the Beatles in the internet age. It's really yeah. changed everything. Well, very good. Jude, let's stop there. We're going to do this in a three, three different parts. So we're going to end the video here and we're going to pick up in part two and talk about your latest volume, Shades of Life, which talks about the first eight months of 1965. Help, I need somebody, help, not just any.